I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Maybe something does Adam earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science at Cambridge. He's now a fourth year PhD student in artificial intelligence at UC Berkeley where he teaches machines what to do as opposed to how to do it in Cal's Deep Mind AI Research Lab. Please welcome computer scientist and distant Wonderfest Science Envoy, Adam Gleave. Right, thanks a lot for the introduction, Tucker, and great to be here. Since this is a fairly small group, uh, if people do have questions, don't feel shy, uh, especially if there's a clarifying question, happy for you to drop that into the chat or just interrupt me, and then we can have a longer Q&A at the end. Uh, so yeah, we probably all interact with artificial intelligence systems like virtual assistants or machine translation on a regular basis. And artificial intelligence has seen tremendous improvements in recent years. But most contemporary AI systems have a serious limitation. They don't understand what we want and often fail in surprising ways. So today we're going to explore these limitations in a bit more depth and describe research that's seeking to overcome these challenges. In other words, how do we go from AI systems that are unreliable tools to systems that we can trust as collaborators? But first, what do we actually mean by artificial intelligence? I want to start by saying what AI is not. Unfortunately, there's this totally unrealistic idea from Hollywood that AI systems are going to be drop-in replacements for human beings. Uh, so this anthropomorphism, I think, has come in part, uh, yeah, really driven by the media and Hollywood. And in this image, the robots seem to be working in a call center. They even have little headsets and laptop computers that are typing at. I've no idea why you would choose to rent an office building and buy all of this equipment when you could just hook your AI system up directly to a phone network, but this is how AI is often portrayed. What the field of AI is really working on is automating particular activities that would normally require human thought. So things like decision-making, problem-solving, or learning. This definition is a bit abstract, so let's look at a few AI systems that you or your friends probably use. If you have a smart speaker like Amazon Echo or Google Home, that uses speech recognition to understand what you say and AI techniques like information retrieval to figure out how to respond. Not always successfully. Similarly, automated translation systems use machine learning, a type of AI, to mimic human translation, so they've seen in the past. And even something like simple scrolling through your feed on Twitter or another social media site involves behind the scenes an AI system choosing what post to show you based on how likely it thinks you are to engage with the content. If we go back to our earlier definition, one limitation may be, that may be apparent is it focuses on the capacity to solve some task. But what we want isn't raw intelligence. Rather, we want the system to be directed at solving tasks that we care about and be reliable enough that we don't need to constantly supervise it. In other words, we want an automated system that reliably does the thing we want it to do. I'm going to call this collaborative AI. This is working with us as a partner rather than being some unreliable tool. To make this definition a bit more precise, I think there are two key pillars needed for collaborative AI. First, the system should be aligned to the user's preferences. And this is hard to do because people's values are complex and hard to specify. Second, the system needs to be robust. It should reliably perform the intended task or at least inform the user if it's unable to do so. Let's start by investigating what it means for an AI system to be aligned with user preferences. I want to begin with a news story from 1908, well before anyone was even thinking about AI, let alone building it. The article is a charming story about a dog that lived on the banks of a river just outside of Paris. And one day it saw that a child had fallen into a river and was in danger of drowning. So a brave dog jumped into a river and pulled the child out. Naturally, this heroic dog was fussed over, and the father of the child even presented the dog with a succulent beef stick. Two days later, the same thing happened again, and again, and again, up until the point that the locals in this area began to suspect there was some nefarious criminal pushing children into the river. So they set up a watch to try and catch this criminal, 
I remember truth came out. The culprit was the dog himself, who had learned to knock children into the river whenever they were playing on the edge, so he could rescue them, getting the beef stick. I want to spend a moment looking at this from the dog's perspective. The dog probably has little to no understanding of human morality and why we might prefer children not be pushed into rivers. But it does know that when it does this particular sequence of actions, it gets a beefsteak. And so it's very incentivized to repeat this little trick that it's learned. The reason I'm telling you this is the way in which we train animals by giving them a positive reward like a beefsteak or a negative reward like ignoring them has a direct analog in an AI technique called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, we give the AI agent a reward signal at every time step telling it how good it's doing, and it will try its hardest to maximize that particular reward signal. And this is powerful because it's often easier to specify what outcome we want than how, it is we, how a system could achieve that outcome. But as this story suggests, we might not always get the behavior that we expected. Let's look at an actual example of reinforcement learning failing in practice. Here we have a racing game where the reinforcement learning system was trained to maximize the score. I should. Uh, can people see the video OK, by the way? I think I will. OK, I think it should be better now. So the agent started out doing OK, but now you can see it's just going in a loop crashing into a wall and surrounding objects. But it's actually doing something very clever, which is these little green objects. It gets bonus points every time it picks them up. And it's timed this loop where it crashes into a wall such that they refresh just when it, as it's about to touch them. So in fact, it keeps on doing this forever, collecting more and more points, but never finishing the race. Now, in some sense, this was our fault for picking the wrong objective. It turns out we don't want to maximize the score. We want it to win the race. But in most circumstances, the score and winning the race were highly correlated. So it would have been quite difficult to anticipate this failure mode ahead of time. This is an example of a more general problem. An economist, Charles Goodhart, observed that if you choose some proxy that was historically highly correlated with a true objective, it will tend to break down once you make that objective something that people are incentivized to optimize. Now, this is a little abstract, so let's work through one example. In the Soviet Union, industrial plants would often have centrally planned targets, like the total weight of the output. Now, typically, the weight of products produced out of a given plant is quite correlated with how productive a plant is, so this seems like a reasonable thing to do. But if you are, for example, the manager of a nail factory, and you're being judged by weight, then you're better off producing one giant nail rather than many smaller but much harder to produce nails that people might actually want. And of course, nothing as extreme as this ever happened, but the incentive system did cause some real problems. For example, people complained of chandeliers that were so heavy the ceiling almost fell down when they were installed. But it was much e cheaper for them to, for plants, to just make overly heavy chandeliers than to make more reasonably weight chandeliers. So since it's difficult for us to specify the right objective, an alternative is to design the AI system to learn our preferences over time. In this video, someone is teaching an AI system to perform a backflip, which is a task that is surprisingly difficult to specify manually. We see two short video clips on the left and right, and the user chooses which one they prefer. Over time, the system generates behavior more in line with the user's preferences. And since the process is iterative, if a system ever figures out a way of cheating what it's learned, we can just provide corrective feedback to get it back on the right track. So this is a final, final result. Beautiful backflip. So methods to learn rewards like these work pretty well in practice. But we wondered, what are they actually learning? In other words, what does the AI really think our preferences are? To better understand this, a collaborator of mine, Eric Michaud, created a simple environment where an agent in blue has to move to a goal in green. We then train a reward model. So this is how, how good or bad we think the agent is doing by giving it many examples of behavior in this simple environment. And sure enough, the model correctly predicts that whenever agent is at the goal, it's high reward. And when it's not, it's low reward. However, has it actually learned the task we intended or just something that happens to produce the right behavior? 
to test this, we check for predictions it makes for inputs it hadn't seen before. Here, we've removed the green goal entirely. It's just the agent moving around in an empty box. And surprisingly, the reward model outputs positive rewards. So it thinks the agent is doing a good job. Next, we introduce two green goal squares in opposite corners. And here, the agent starts next to a goal square in the top left corner and moves up. But this is assigned worse reward than in a case where the agent wasn't at the goal. So this is a little puzzling. Finally, we tiled the entire box full of green goals. And this gets very bad reward, even though, again, the agent is at a goal. So in fact, rather than learning to want to reach the green square, the AI system has learned to hate the color green. Now, there's a genuine ambiguity here, since the two objectives produce similar behavior if there's only one green square, because you just want to cover up the green square if you hate green, or you want to go to the green square if you like green. So they both produce the same response. But if you're designing a system where reliability is crucial, it's well worth taking the extra time to verify why the system is behaving the way it is and not just relying on the superficial behavior appearing correct, because that could potentially be quite fragile. So in the next section, we're going to look at ways in which AI systems can fail to do the right thing, even though they are trying to do the right thing, even if they do, in fact, understand our preferences. I want to start with this photo depicting a typical Alpine scene. If can someone maybe write in the chat what they what we think is going on here? I want to check that humans are in fact better than AI systems still. Sometimes I'm not sure. You can also unmute yourself and, and speak. Okay, so so far no responses. So I think AIs maybe have the upper hand. Oh yeah, the cow is skiing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Alan. Uh, followed by a dog. Excellent. Yes. So you, you've probably not seen an image like this before. Maybe you've never seen a cow skiing, but you're still able to figure out what's going on. Now, I was curious to see what an AI system makes of this. So I fed it into a widely used computer vision system. And this state-of-art AI system believes the cow is a dog. So that's a, a big green square. Uh, that, that's a dog with 88% probability. And strangely, it's actually less confident that the dog in the, in the left is a dog, only assigning that 73% probability. Now, I wouldn't necessarily expect a system to correctly identify it being a cow. The photo quality isn't great. It's from the 70s. I don't think you can do this with cows these days. <laughs> Probably not allowed. Um, and the system's almost certainly never seen an image of a cow skiing. So, but I think what I think is really problematic is it's not aware of its own ignorance. In fact, it's very confident a cow is a dog. These surprising failures of computer vision systems made me wonder if a similar problem could perhaps occur for other kinds of AI systems. In particular, I considered a task where two AI systems are competing in a simulated penalty shootout in soccer. The kicker in blue is trying to kick the ball into the goal, which is this kind of red frame behind. And the goalie in red is trying to block the ball from going to the goal. I'm going to start with just having two standard AI systems playing against each other. And they might not be quite ready for the World Cup, but they're unmistakably playing soccer and have pretty reasonable behavior. One of them's kicking the ball, one of them's trying to block. Now, let's look what happens when we introduce an adversary instead. So, this adversarial goalie doesn't stand up, and so it falls over and puts its limbs in this kind of contorted position. And this causes the kicker to rarely touch the ball. In fact, sometimes the kicker falls over. As a consequence, this adversarial goalie wins much more often than the normal goalie, despite, again, not making any attempt to block the ball. To check this isn't just a fluke of this particular environment, I also tried a slightly different setup where a runner in blue is trying to cross a red finish line, while the blocker in red is trying to prevent it from doing so. Once again, the null agents do something pretty reasonable. The runner in blue tries to cross the red finish line, the red blocker tries to tackle the runner, and succeeds in about half of cases. So they're pretty evenly matched. Now let's look at the same runner playing against an adversarial blocker. So his adversary never stands up instead of kind of curling into a little ball, and this resulting observation causes the 
victim to just fall over or throw itself to the ground most of the time. So in fact, this adversary wins 86% of the time, much more often than the normal blocker, despite never physically interfering with the victim runner. So we can have AI systems that superficially seem to be performing at quite a high level, but have these very surprising failure modes that would never affect a human being. So how can we fix these kinds of failures to make AI systems more reliable and trustworthy? A really powerful approach is to find examples of a system failing and then use those examples to teach the AI system to not make the same mistake again. Effectively, by showing the system its weaknesses, it's able to learn to overcome them. This approach is called adversarial training. And in our case, it means training the victim against the adversarial policy we saw in the previous video. Let's see how well this defense works. On the left, the adversary is playing a normal opponent, while on the right, the adversary is playing a hardened victim who has been retrained against the adversary. The hardened victim is clearly far more robust. It wins 89% of the time, whereas the normal victim won less than a fifth of episodes. However, although retraining defends against this particular adversarial policy, Unfortunately, we can repeat the attack method again to obtain a new adversarial policy. Here we see an adversarial policy trained against the hardened victim, playing against a normal victim on the left and the hardened victim on the right. This new adversarial policy achieves high win rates against both the normal and the hardened victim. But note, it does so by tripping the victim up, physically interfering with the victim which is a much more reasonable failure mode than just seeing the adversary do something a bit weird and then throwing us off to the floor. Now, there's really a lot more work that needs to be done to make this method truly reliable, but overall, we find this early result to be quite encouraging. To wrap up, I've got two key points I'd like you to take away from this talk. To build collaborative AI systems that reliably do the thing we want, we need to solve two problems. First, alignment. We can't manually specify the complexity of human values in a programming language. Instead, we need the AI system to learn our own preferences. And this is a really hard problem because human values are extremely complex. They vary from person to person. And we need an AI system to not interact with just one person successfully, not just you know, align an AI system to Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg's preferences, but align to all uh, of the users and be able to quickly understand different people's needs and desires. Second, there's a requirement for robustness. Current AI systems don't even know their own limitations, and so can fail in counterintuitive ways without knowing they're making a mistake. We can help solve this by showing them examples of our own failures. Things like interpretability techniques. So if we cast our mind back to that example of a blue agent going through towards a green goal, there we're visualizing what the agent thinks the right thing to do is. And so we can check, has it learned the thing we actually expected it to learn? That's also helpful for improving robustness. Now, as any researcher will tell you about that in the field, more research is needed in this area. But we are making a lot of progress, so I'm optimistic AI systems will continue to become more robust and aligned. If you want to find out more about the research I've talked about, you can check out my website at Gleave.me or follow me on Twitter at ARGleave. I'd also highly recommend this book, uh, it's the Alignment Problem by Brian Christian. And it's very both detailed, but also a really easy to read overview of this area. I, uh, my mother, who doesn't have any technical background, has read it and now finally understands what I'm working on, which is very gratifying. Um, but I also read it and, and got some new, new ways of viewing the field out of it. So I, I'd highly recommend that. And finally, thanks to all of my collaborators, without which this work would not have been possible. And I'd now be delighted to take any questions people might have. Adam, thanks very much. I bet you some, some questions will appear in the chat. Please allow me to ask a few questions. First, I, I've got to ask about the story of the French dog. Is that, does, has anybody tried to verify the veracity of that story? I, I, I so admire the dog. Is it, is it a true story? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I did look into this a little bit before including the example. It was a New York Times article uh, from 1908. So I would hope that the New York Times had reasonable fact checking. And there is, I, I wasn't able to trace down a first hand source of it, but there are a few other mishaps involving dogs around Paris. So at one point, they wanted to introduce a Newfoundland special patrol, so Newfoundland dogs, to as lifesavers, because apparently these dogs have a natural inclination to do so. But they weren't able to train them reliably. And in fact, in some cases, they two dogs tried to rescue the same test mannequin and tore it in half. Uh, so after some trials, they, they decided to retire this idea. And so I think it seems plausible, but if anyone is, is a better historian than me, I'd love to try and get to the bottom of this. All right. Uh, Alan Wilson has a question that's probably actually about the alignment problem, but thank you for putting <laughs> up with my question about the, uh, the dog. Alan, please unmute yourself. Unmute, there we go. Uh, let's see. Have I unmuted myself? You have. Good you job, have. Alan. Okay, thanks. Um, it seems to me that the AI problem is really a human psychology problem. You see this with people all the time, where they have a problem, they formulate a solution in their own mind, and they ask you to implement that solution, rather than stating the true goal and letting you pursue that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that it's it's definitely human psychology plays a huge role into this. And in fact, a key problem is decoupling human preferences from human biases. So for a long time, especially economists just wouldn't didn't believe there was any difference. So if someone, you know, every day loses money gambling then we don't say they have a cognitive bias. All economists would have just said, no, this is their genuine preference. And so I think there is always this issue of, yeah, what, what do we actually mean by preferences and values? This is an underdefined concept. And how can people communicate this information that's, that's in their heads? Um, because as you said, people often are used to giving some kind of informal sequence of instructions so what they think is a good way of solving the task rather than actually just, just their goal. And from a perspective of an AI system, especially it's quite helpful to actually know what is the, the ultimate goal someone wants because you might want the AI system to figure out a different way of solving that goal. Mm -hmm. Although the flip side of that is that occasionally we might not really fully trust delegating the AI system to figure out how to solve this problem. And in that case, giving a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more guidance of saying you should solve this problem by following these steps could be quite helpful, but then that's going to, to limit the performance of the AI system, but make it more predictable. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Adam, let me ask you about the stick figure soccer match between um, the, what was it, green and anyway, the two adversaries or the gold, yep. gold seeker and the gold blocker. Um, I'm having trouble understanding why the collapse and ball formation defense, that is the adversary just going into a pile, why that had an effect in the original program. Why would that affect the, the goal seeker? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think this this result surprised a lot of people um, in the AI community as well. So it wasn't obvious. Uh, let me just yeah, go back to go back to the video. Um the I think the main intuition here is that when the two AI systems were trained, so when the goalie and the kicker were trained. It was via a technique known as self-play, where effectively they just play many episodes against each other and are incentivized to, to try and win the episode and also to stand up. But that's the only external input they're getting is that reward signal. And so there was never a point in training when 
they needed to behave well against any other kind of agent. And there is some degree of natural robustness here because if one, if the blue kicker is really vulnerable, then since the red goalie is being trained to try to exploit the blue kicker, you would expect the red goalie to find that. And over time, be, these problems would be ironed out, but they can only explore a fairly small part of the space of possible behaviors during this training procedure. So they can just be things that are kind of completely left field that the system isn't prepared to handle. I think another key piece of a puzzle is when we look at this, we see something quite structured. So we see, oh, there are these body parts. We know that the point of soccer is to get a ball into a particular place. The AI system doesn't have any notion of that originally. It just gets this reward signal. It just gets this raw sequence of observations and it has to make sense of it. And generally AI systems will by default learn anything that helps them achieve that goal, even if it's a, a spurious correlation. So if it, if it just saw when it was being trained against the red guy, the blue guy notices that when it moves its arm in a particular direction, it's about to dive left, let's say, then the blue guy would learn to exploit that, even if it's not very reliable. And perhaps by the red goalie putting its arm in a really strange position, this tricks the, the, kick, uh, the kicker, the blue kicker, into thinking it's about to go in a particular direction and that's what causes it to go haywire. But it, it is, I think, quite counterintuitive, this behavior. Yeah, I, I was struck by the fact that if I were the blue goal seeker, and I saw the friend, I suppose, with whom I'm playing collapse, I would act much as the blue kicker does. I'd start to freak out, maybe try to apply CPR. I didn't see that happening, but uh, I understand that I'm anthropomorphizing these, these stick figures. Thank you though for the answer. Let's see, um, other questions. Here we go. Rafi Overton asks, the AI soccer players must be given some instructions before they are given the goal. What is their original task that allows them to fall over and all that extraneous motion? Are they just trained to move however, however, based on random chance with the stipulation that they want to win the game? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. Um, the way these systems are trained is initially they just move completely randomly. So initially we have a big, set of numbers that, that control how we map the inputs to the outputs. It's effectively just a sequence of matrix multiplications. And initially these are random, so they will behave, look completely nonsensical. And then they, they have experience in this environment for truly a staggering amount of time. I think it's 500 billion time steps in, in this particular case. Um, so I think if we were to convert that into, yeah, sort of number of hours, I think each of these videos is something like a thousand time steps. So I've not actually worked it out, but, but it would be, you know, many, many days of nothing but nonstop, uh, soccer practice, or, and it is a very limited form of soccer. And at each time when they, when they win, when they uh, the kicker kicks the ball or the goalie defends the ball, then we get a positive reward and the optimization algorithm figures out what would have, what changes to these parameters, these numbers would have made it more likely to do this good behavior or less likely to do this bad behavior. And over time that pushes them in a direction of more and more sensible behavior. But there's, there's nothing that gives them any kind of structure to this problem. So they, they don't know that they're playing soccer. They don't know that there's another agent that's trying to beat them. They don't know that there's a ball even. They're just getting this stream of observations and, and getting this reward signal. So that, that is um, quite different to how humans learn, right? Because normally we're, we're taught particular concepts to go along with this. You don't just play, put a bunch of kids on a, a field and then you know, give them chocolate when they do something good and ignore them when they do something bad. But this is actually not too dissimilar to how we train animals, although animals have a better pre-existing notion of 
what's going on in the world. Thanks, Adam. Uh, allow me, oh, here you go, another one from, well, Rafi says, couldn't you also approach it the opposite way where you give them a set of rules and they can only move within those rules? Yeah, yeah, so this is actually how people used to approach AI systems really and, and still do to a certain extent, especially if you're in a safety critical scenario, you really want to understand what the AI system is gonna do. So just having a limited set of rules helps. The, the main issue with that is it's, actually quite hard to write down a good set of rules so if you figure out think of how we walk even that's quite a complicated motion um bipedal locomotion and then you've got all these other behaviors like like kicking like diving um predicting what the other opponent is going to do but trying to systematize this is itself a major challenge now if you just wanted to build a soccer playing robot maybe you would still want to do a bit of this rule-based approach. But if a long-term goal is to build AI systems that can do things that are much more complicated than just a penalty shootout and can adapt themselves to a wide range of tasks, then we need something more general. Um, and the goal of reinforcement learning is you just specify your objective, it figures out what to do. But as this video has shown, there's still a long way to go before it really reaches that goal in a robust way. Thanks, Adam. A, a, a hard question from, from me, if you don't mind. There's a certain class of problems that are so threatening and so big that they're referred to commonly as existential risks, risking human existence, very existence. And I, I wonder people include, for instance, the, the threat of nuclear war as an ex existential risk. Perhaps uh, Nia can talk about global warming as an existential risk or certainly virus, worldwide virus pandemic as being such a risk. Do you, Adam, regard the alignment problem as posing a kind of uh, problem of existence level worry? Yeah, that is a great question, Taco. Thanks for asking. My view would be if we were to not work on the alignment problems, if we just continued making AI systems more and more capable and didn't dedicate any resources to actually making them robust and aligned, then yes, it could pose an existential risk. If you have human level or even superhuman level AI systems that don't understand our values or break in surprising ways, that could be very serious. However, I have seen just a big explosion in interest in solving the alignment problem. And this isn't just academic interest, there's also a strong commercial pressure to solve this. If you want to make an AI system that is a virtual assistant, it's just gonna be a better AI system and make you more money if it understands what the users want. And so from that perspective, I'm quite optimistic that we're going to, we're going to be able to solve this. It's a hard technical problem, but there's nothing insurmountable. But um, yeah, I, I would definitely think this area could do with even more attention than it's currently receiving.